Anybody? Okay, just getting settled. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I Other people feel the same way on that one, or the graph is wrong or confusing? I'm just I'm withdrawn. I don't get how your capital is increased just because your weight. If you couldn't decrease the amount of capital you provide just because your weight should be increased. Okay. Chapter 15, number 15. Chapter 7. Get my little page catchers down here. Okay, I'm finally here. Maybe. All right, so which part bothers you the most there? The capital increases with the, the increase in price of labor. So on what part of the graph are you talking about? The uh, second, isotop one. Try the second isotop one. So, so this is all coming from, this is number 15, chapter 7. Suppose an increase in the minimum wage alters the cost of producing fast food hamburgers. Uh, show what happens to McDonald's long run expansion path as a result of this wage increase. So intuition is telling us that uh, there's going to be a substitution, if it's possible, to some degree of capital for labor, right? So more capital being used. It's usually a good uh, gut shot thing to start with. All right. Um, all right, let's see if this shows up on film or much. All right, so this picture. <clears throat> Since labor becomes more expensive, the ISO cost lines will rotate clockwise uh, from the blue lines to the red ones. And the long run expansion path, which shows points to C between ISO cost and ISO costs, shifts up as a result of the increased employment. The optimal production would employ more capital and less labor. Okay, so a fairly general, general statement there. So what parts, Bob, Chelsea? So their description of the slope change. I think the end result would be the same, but the, the expansion path would increase. It would shift. It's just that they can sell the ice across Yeah, I, I think I see what maybe maybe one of the issues might be. So if we take this ISO cost line, what do they got? What are they calling it? C one A and C one B, right? So they were um, taking it and changing it. They didn't pin it down at capital. That sounds like part of what maybe is bothering you, right? Because when we think about a, an increase in the price of labor, then this, this stays pinned here and slopes in. Is that part of what you were thinking? And that's true. I mean, you guys are right with your intuition there. Um, 
then you could kind of do a, an income substitution effect type of scenario is what's going on because they're treating the quantity constant and saying, well, where would it be on that holding quantity constant line? And then they're simply going back to that isoquant and analyzing it. So your intuition was correct that if the problem would have been, here's your cost and there's an increase in minimum wage, then this would rotate in and we'd be moving around. But the thing that we're doing is we're holding quantity constant and analyzing the effects along those isoquant lines that are drawn there. Make sense? They hold the same They hold the same isoquant. Right. Right. Which wasn't directly, uh, it, honestly, that, that was probably just a more of ease of graphing than anything else. It was just to kind of show you, uh, imagine we were here, because notice we were at points of tangency along this one, right? And then just for so that we don't get it too, we could have done a shift and then we could have done a new isoquant and it would have followed this path all the way up, but it would have got pretty messy graphically. Okay, you did that. Okay, well that's fine. And, and mentally I think that was uh, good for you to go, go through it with that progression. Okay, anything else? Yes. 12C. All right, suppose a firm has the following production function. The marginal product of capital for the production is 2L, marginal product 2K for labor. If capital rents for 100, labor can be hired for 200, and the firm is minimizing costs. What's the total cost is part A, what's the average cost is B, and you were wondering about C. What is the marginal cost of producing Q units of output, okay? So what did you do or? Um, well, I wasn't sure all, um, like I knew the marginal cost would be um, the additional cost for one, one more unit. Um, yes. And so like I, um, so I know it's like the change in total cost or the change in quantity and the marginal cost. Yes. Like Okay. All right. Like what they have the back. All right. Um, what did you guys do for this one, Curtis? Derivative. You did derivative. Okay, but that's not. In, technically, that's not. Is there another way? How else did you guys go about it? <clears throat> so we weren't really given a marginal cost function here, right? this particular problem. Average cost. So we choose from the, uh, the marginal product of labor of the marginal product of the capital and then that uh, equal to, set it equal to Set it equal to the price ratio? Yeah. Well, we need to, we, we need to, uh, which is what was done on the screen here. So that was the first step, um, getting the optimal condition, working our way down to this total cost function, right? And as Curtis said, marginal cost would be the first derivative of that function, but we're not in derivative world, supposedly. Um, <coughs> that would possibly be a way to go, not very clean way to go. Um, I'm struggling. I'm not seeing it. So I think you're right. I, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I'm 
not seeing how you'd use that without doing a derivative. That, that's why in, in these problems, we're usually given the marginal product or the marginal cost or the marginal utility. It's given to you in the equation. They basically give you some equation for it. So. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. No, I know. I, I see. I, that's what I noticed too. Is that I, I, and I'm kind of racking my brain to see if there's some other backdoor way to do it. Um, but we got uh, marginal cost equals the change in total cost over the change in quantity. Um, if the quantity change was one. You'd have to evaluate it at some quantity, which we haven't solved for any quantities. And it's not a constant function. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that one's possible. I think they screwed up. So I won't screw you up on the test, but that is the first derivative of this thing. So if you've got yeah, Q. I understand that. I'm yeah. Sure yep. I think they screwed up. They needed to uh, put uh, put something in there to, or n probably just not ask that question. Actually, would probably be for this particular problem because they were fine until they got to that point. If they uh, if they did give you, I think you could use Brenson's method. If they if they gave you enough information to solve for. Um, to solve for Q. And so let's say that the optimal quantities, or maybe they just gave it to you and they said, um, the optimal quantity of producing is 100. Then you could probably do what Brenson was suggesting is plug in 100, calculate the number, plug it, and then the question would have to be worded, what's the marginal cost of the next unit at the optimal production level? So then you'd go 100, 101, take the difference, and that would be your marginal cost. It's arbitrary the way it's written. I'm saying there would have to be more written into the there would have to be more written into the problem to, to approach the problem that way. So in other words, I'm back to it can't be solved the way it is. I think there'd have to be some more information. Okay. Seventeen. This is not a calculus based yeah. class. So. so like I mean if I just like wrote a description basically like what I just told you, how I would find the marginal. Yeah. Um, Hopefully I wouldn't put you in a position and I wouldn't hold you accountable for any points on an exam if, if I screwed up and did the same thing, but I'm pretty sure that that's a screw up there. Okay, uh, seventeen. So a builder of custom motorcycles has a choice of operating out of one garage or two. When it operates out of one garage, its average total cost of production is given by that. If it operates out of two garages, its average uh, total cost of production is given by ATT2. What does this firm's long run average total cost curve look like? Can you describe it as a function? Okay, fun. All right, so what's your question? What's going on? There's the answer. What what's your main question? How to approach it all together? Just kind of a So you see how they'd be indifferent between the two on the first part, right? Setting them equal <coughs> one to the average cost. So for what does firm's long run cost curve, if it operates, can you describe? Oh, oh no, you had to come up with that on your own. It didn't explicitly ask you that, did it? So you. It wasn't explicitly asked what was going on with setting the two equal to each other, was it? Yeah, I just did that. I, I saw that. Like, I didn't even know if I was supposed to do that. Yeah. I just did that. Okay. So um, 
let me let me back up a step on this one. The do you remember? Um, sorry, Sam. Hopefully this will make sense. But I, I talked about a small, medium, and large building with average total cost curves back in principles class. So we had the small building, the large building, or the medium building, and possibly the the large building. And all these were were average total cost curves associated with some capital being fixed, meaning that if we were operating currently at 100 units, um, that would be the least cost possible for that production level. But as we start to scale our production, we wouldn't want to be, if we double our output, if we're stuck with the small building, we're rubbing elbows and bumping into each other, we're not being as efficient as we were, right? The appropriate scale of production would call for more capital. If we were to do an ISO quant type analysis, it would say, hey, you'll be more efficient if you, you know, get more capital and less labor, or increase your amount of capital relative to labor. So that ISO quant, ISO cost analysis kind of flows through these short run average cost curves. And so at a production level of 200, we wouldn't want to be in a big fat building. There'd be a lot of excess capacity that we're not using but we'd want to be in a medium-sized building. And we could put square feet under these or whatever. And so there's some optimal level there. And then, of course, if our production uh, jumps up again to uh, 300 or 400 units or whatever, I'm just making up some numbers, then we wouldn't want to be in the medium-sized building. We'd want to be in the large building, right? So we're kind of optimally choosing, in the long run, the right amount of capital and labor. So the long run average cost curve allows all resources to be varied. And what we're starting to do is map out three points on the long run average cost curve. Indeed, there is an infinite number of short run curves for all kinds of sizes of buildings. <coughs> and if I drew all infinite number of them and I connected the minimum point of all the infinite number of them, that would be indistinguishable with a line, which is the lower envelope of each small curve. That essentially is the long run average total cost curve. OK, so that's what's going on here. That's what they're suggesting is that, hey, suppose we got two cost curves. Here is where we're at. Um, they start you off solving the problem saying, well, I wouldn't care which garage we're in if we're at some level. That would be one of these intersection points where I had these two crossing. That would be an indifferent point. But at lower production level, they don't want to be on the smaller one of those, ATC1 or 2. Did they put them in order for us? Looks like they did. So if you graphed them out, uh, the, the one corresponds with presumably a, a smaller scale production. And we can start to think about those points. So uh, less than four, um, we'd be with this size garage. Greater than four, we'd want to be in the bigger garage. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. You said you look to each other so you can establish Yes, that's right. When to switch. And then. Ultimately, uh, that kind of presents itself as a discrete problem, right? But it's also important to know that this size garage or this size garage, in the long run, I can get any size garage I want. I can, my lease will be up or whatever at one of these garages, I can move anywhere. And so even at this production level, there's probably another garage that's somewhere in between the size of the two where I'd want to be. Uh, Sam? Nineteen. Uh, Suppose that a firm has the following Cobb Douglas production function. Um, so this functional form, uh, I don't know if you saw that. I didn't highlight it in lecture, but that's a, a kind of a famous pro, um, technology of how we get these curved lines called the Cobb Douglas. So it's kind of a standard. It follows a lot of the properties. So you'll see that come up 
in economics as a functional form that when you hear the word Cobb Douglas, like if you're reading a journal article about something in economics and they say, we assumed a Cobb Douglas such and such function, then you know it automatically has all of these properties that we're talking about with the right look, the right quote unquote looking curves and stuff. So um, that's kind of a shorthand we use. So uh, whenever you see, uh, what do you see about the exponents here? They add up to one. That's it. That's Cobb Douglas. <clears throat> okay. Um, what must its what must its long run total cost curve look like? Its long run average total cost curve. How do your answers to A change if the production function is uh, Q equals K L? <coughs> okay. So Sam, back to your question. Now that we got the the parameters of that down. What's your general question? Well, well, I hate how, about how do I know? Oh, hey. Duh. OK, now I'm feeling a little foolish. I thought this thing should be able to I can do this or this. Got it. I just push this thing up, and then I can go down on my page. OK. All right, it's only taken me. How long have I been at OU now using these machines? Well, these came in a little bit later, so. Maybe a year. Learning curve. Got it. Uh, how do I know if it, it's um, increasing uh, return to scale or process? Or oh, okay. So this on on the <coughs> returns to scale. Um, so anybody want to take that? So it's a kind of a plug and chug. Uh, we did one question in class like that. So if you go back to your um, function, it has K and L, capital and labor. So what's an easy ones to experiment with? One and one, and then go up to two. So you can pick anything you want to determine the constant returns to scale. So in the long run, again, the distinction here with the long run is that both things can vary. Nothing's fixed. That, always remember that. Long run means I can vary all inputs. And so if I, uh, to just to keep the numbers easy, if you ever get the opportunity like this to plug and chug, keep life simple for yourself, just say that both equal one. No big deal. Plug it in. And then... For returns to scale, you do need to, du you don't have to, but it's a heck of a lot easier if you just double all the inputs. So then plug in a two, and import most importantly, see what Q1 is and Q2, and what the output levels do. So in this, they didn't even show examples here, but let's just say if, if this turned out to be 100, and this answer turned out to be 210, we've got increasing returns to scale. I doubled, I doubled my labor, and it led to more than double on the output. If this number would have been 195, I've got decreasing returns to scale. A doubling of the inputs led to less than double. And of course, constant returns to scale would be 200. Double inputs, double output. And so with that Cobb-Douglas, we end up getting um, the constant return. Anything else on that problem? OK. So um, well, we turn those in. I handed out, did I give you guys those? We didn't even get to that, did we? OK, we got some new sheets. So we started with perfect competition. We started with perfect competition last time. And I just kind of gave a quick principles rundown 
of perfect competition. Uh oh, where's my sheets? Did I did I pass those out to you? Is there in here? Okay. So maybe Mr. Projector is going to come back down. I was, I think, looking at him this morning. They must be on my desk. Okay, so fairly simple one for starters. So don't be, kind of trust your judgment and don't be um, fooled by the simplicity of it. Stick to your guns. Why don't you just work this out on your notebook papers? Get. Got some answers yet? This is chapter eight, yes. So this is perfect competition. So, how many haircuts? 15, like I said, don't be, this one's so simple. But you do got to know the mechanics that comes from the little graph I gave you last time. So, perfect competition should be ding, 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 ding. Oh, wait a second. I know what perfect competition is. The firm is a price taker. So, remember that. Price equals marginal. <coughs> In perfect competition, the market price equals the marginal revenue for the firm. So every haircut is going to generate additional revenue of the market price. I do another haircut, I get 15 bucks. I do another haircut, I get 15 more bucks. So the additional revenue from every haircut is 15 bucks. So maximize profits by setting the uh, revenue generated by the last unit equal to the cost of the last unit. Here again, it was so simple. It was just Q, but marginal revenue equals marginal cost. 
So I think be a little bit more formal, even though your gut might know if you guys are being a little more formal with this, especially on a test and I ask you to show your work, we might want to um, produce quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Here, marginal revenue equals 15 equals marginal cost, which equals Q. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost, Q equals 15. How much profit will it earn? How do we calculate profit? Another ding, ding, ding. Total revenue minus total cost. Have this one off the top of your charts. So there's a number of different ways potentially to calculate these creatures. Usually this one's simply P times Q. Right? The price is 15. The quantity is 15. We just learned at the optimal quantity. Minus our total cost. Our marginal cost is constant at Q. So what's our what's our total cost? Go back into this equation. We got a Q squared. So 0.5 times 15 squared. And what do we get? Twelve, $112.50. That sounds about right. They should have got $225 here and $112.50, giving you $112.50 worth of profit. Okay. Next problem. boxes are produced in a perfectly competitive market. Ding, 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 ding. Perfectly competitive market means price dagger, which means price equals marginal revenue. So have that bell ring. And every time you read a problem like that, that's the bell ringer right there when you see perfectly competitive market. Each identical firm has a short run total cost uh, curve of that, where Q is measured in thousands of boxes. So highlight things like thousands. Make sure we get the units right. <coughs> the firm's associated marginal cost is that. Calculate the price below which a firm in the market will not produce any output in the short run. The shutdown price. All right, shutdown. Who remembers shutdown? What was the <coughs> what was the concept going on with shutdown? And how much money are you losing if you shut down? The fixed cost. Good. So this was the whole relationship of variable versus fixed cost. So when we shut down, first of all, we produce nothing. But we still are obligated to our fixed cost. Producing nothing means we, we have profits that are P times Q, but Q being equal to zero, that deletes. Minus our total variable cost, just to throw this, this way of thinking about things. Our variable costs are dependent upon Q. Those disappear, but you're still left with some fixed costs. So when you shut down, your profits are equal to your fixed cost in the negative direction. So you have a loss 
but your loss is equal to your fixed cost. So that's when you shut down. So what is the shutdown point in general? Marginal cost equals average variable cost. So that was, if we go back to our generic representation, we've got average total cost like this. I like to draw a big fat thing for the minimum. We've got average variable costs that swoop up and get dangerously close as your fixed costs are spread out over more and more units. <coughs> And that bottoms out somewhere. And your marginal cost curve cuts through always through the minimum point of both averages, which is kind of handy now to solve a problem like this. Because if your price falls below your average variable cost, you're going to lose less money by shutting down was what we learned. And so the actual supply curve in perfect competition looks like this little squiggly. So remember, the supply curve and the marginal cost curve are one and the same over most ranges of production, but not all ranges, because of the shutdown point. And so the quantity supplied by a profit-maximizing firm, if the price is less than average, variable cost is zero. So we have this discontinuous supply function, right? The supply curve is the squiggly. The marginal cost curve is the good old J-shaped function just like this. So they're one and the same over a certain range. That's when price is greater than average variable cost. So the key takeaway for working through some of these problems to add another bullet on, or maybe a couple more. I don't know if I can stop at one bullet. So marginal cost equals supply when price is greater than or equal to average variable cost. However, quantity supplied equals zero when price is less than average variable cost. That is precisely our shutdown point. When price is less than average variable cost, we shut down and produce nothing. So there's the graphical representation. This is something we see for uh, kind of supporting that graph. And then back to this problem, calculate the price which the firm will not produce the shutdown price. We need to start working the math. So go work the math now. You've got average variable cost. The marginal cost is given to you in this problem, unlike that other one. We don't have to take the first derivative of some function. So what's your first step as you're looking at this and starting to approach it? We've got a total cost function. Find your total variable cost function. Good. And then find your average. Divide by Q. So go for it. There's your total cost function. What is your total variable cost? got to remember that total cost equals total variable cost plus total fixed. My total cost function in this problem is what? 3Q cubed minus 18 squared plus 30Q plus 50. How do we marry up this concept with this concept, the more generic thought with the actual functional form. Which is which? I've got total cost broken down into total variable cost and total fixed. With this 
explicit functional form, what's what? Anything with a Q is variable, good. And anything without is fixed. That's it. It's that simple. We got Qs here. That's by definition what makes a variable cost. 50 is not dependent upon quantity. So another way to think about it mathematically is if I produce nothing, substitute in a Q equals 0, collapses, 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 I'm left with this. Okay. Jump the step here. The total variable cost is just that part, dividing by Q. Anybody jump to an answer already? John? Q is 3. So our next step here was to set marginal cost equal to average variable cost which leads you to solving for q equals 3 the problem didn't ask for the quantity though it asked for what the price which is what does the price end up being 3 just happens to be 3 too and how'd you get that? And it could go into either one. Good. So plug that Q back into this function or the marginal cost function, which I don't have right up here, but here. And you get the, the shutdown price. Let's call it SD, the shutdown price equals $3. Assume that the pickle industry is perfectly competitive and has 150 producers. 100 of these producers are high cost producers, each with a short run supply curve of Q equal to 4P. 50 of these are low cost producers with a short run supply of 6P. Quantities are measured in jars and prices are dollars per jar. Derive the short run industry supply curve for pickles. All right. So before you dive right in, industry supply versus firm supply. What's the connection between the market supply <coughs> function and the individual functions? The sum of them. All right, so I'm going to draw a little bit different graph than what we've done before, just slightly modified here. So here's our market. 
big supply, big demand. The firm is a price taker, right? Because it comes from the actions of a big market. Each firm is a drop of water in the bucket. And then we usually draw the representative firm here. I wanna draw a few more. Let's draw Farmer Tom, Dick, and Harry, and maybe Jim. All right, so there's four different producers. With little Q, little Q, little Q. So we're not having identical producers potentially. And each one of these guys has a marginal cost curve. Maybe Tom's is kind of steep, Dick's is fairly flat, Harry's is like that, and Jim's is like this. All producers face the market price of $8 a bushel. So the $8 a bushel reflects the revenue generated by additional unit produced. The profit maximizing decision by each one of our four different types of producers is the same. All firms maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. Tom, Dick, Harry's there, and finally Jim's out here. And so if this is at 300 units and he's at 150, Tom's at 200, and Jim's at 250, the market supply is going to be 250 plus 200 is 450, 600, 900 units. So we're going to add up all individual pro uh, production by all the firms and get 900 units supplied to the market. So the supply curve in the market, the quantity supplied, is equal to the sum of the individual cost firms for all i equal 1 to n firms. So that the market supply curve is the cost curve, which is what we just did here, folks, right? Supply equals marginal cost on the individual level, as long as price is above average variable cost, so ignoring the, short, the, the shutdown point. So all we're doing is bringing that to the market now, that same logic, all the way across. So for this problem, we're going to have just two types, a Tom type and a Dick type. And one's a high cost, one's a low cost. They're slightly different, but conceptually we're doing the same thing here. All right. So we're going to derive the industry supply curve. If the market demand now for pickles is QD equals 6,000 minus 300P, what are the market equilibrium price and quantity of pickles? Okay, so we're right back to here. Now we've got a functional form here. Once we've derived this from the information, find price equals quantity. At the price you found in part B, how many pickles does each high cost firm produce and how much does each low cost firm produce? Now that we found this, we're gonna work backwards and figure out high cost person, how much? Low cost person, how much? And then finally, we're going to sneak producer surplus back in just for fun. At the price you found in part B, determine the industry producer surplus. What is this area? All right, we'll pick up there on Wednesday. Exam number two is next Monday. I meant to talk about that earlier, but kind of got forgotten. So.